Okay, so we've talked about natural selection, but survival is only one half of fitness. Reproduction is the other half. And just as much, if not more than survival, there's been a phenomenal amount of historical selection pressure to reproduce the most effectively. And as you might guess, this manifests today in human societies in both weird and impactful ways. First, here's some seemingly unrelated data points which will connect. Via testing and tracking Y chromosomes, it's estimated that 800 million men alive today descended from only 11 historical leaders, including Genghis Khan, in the last few thousand years. Here's another anecdote. Imagine if you had a choice between a 4,000 square foot house in a neighborhood where all the other houses were 6,000 square feet, or would you rather have a 3,000 square foot house, a smaller house, in a neighborhood of 2,000 square foot houses? Well, the vast majority of people would prefer to have the smaller house, the 3,000 square foot house, as long as it was bigger than their neighbor's. Here's another example. This is Tiger Woods' yacht on the right. It's next to his ex-wife's new boyfriend, Chris Klein's yacht, which is nine feet longer. Why do we laugh when we see this? What is it that we immediately understand about this situation? Okay, how do these three examples fit together? Let's briefly go back to biology. Think of the three drawbacks to a male peacock of growing such a hugely ornate tail. Number one is the energy, vitamins, and minerals needed to go into the creation of the tail could have been used for other survival reproductive needs. Number two, the tail makes it more likely to be spotted by a predator. Number three, if spotted, this bulky tail makes it less likely to get away from a predator. All three of these negative fitness hits must have been outweighed by the female peahen's preference for males with larger, more ornate tails. Sexual competition, in this example and in many cases in nature, has been a stronger force than natural selection. Wait, humans don't have peacock tails, so how does this even apply to us? While it's true that humans do not have biological displays of sexual health and good genes anywhere as extravagant as a peacock's tail, but does this mean we don't have them at all? Lots of different traits for men and women have historically led to outsized mating opportunities and access to resources. Intelligence, kindness, strength, humor, hunting ability, storytelling ability, and many other attributes. But what is our modern version of a peacock's tail? Well, we make social statements with our cars, our clothes, our technology, our houses, our toys, our comments, and even our friends. Back to nature. There are natural limits on sexually selected traits because they're not social but biological and are physically connected to the metabolism and environment of an organism. A famous example via runaway sexual selection where the males with larger and wider antlers sired offspring with larger and wider antlers. This is an Irish elk that went extinct when the climate and landscape changed in Europe to have more trees and forests. But in a social species such as ours, Biological markers were unnecessary as displays of sexual health, and instead, we evolved to rely on social cues. Modern human signaling is limited only by the amount of energy available to individuals, which in our modern society is incredibly high. What such a high societal throughput means is that our sexually directed traits can grow disproportionately large and wasteful, and largely untethered from our biological fitness. And this goes way beyond sex and mating. We are constantly, consciously or otherwise, comparing ourselves to others, being popular, accepted, sending and receiving social signals. In a famous analysis with more than 80,000 subjects, it was the relative rank of an individual's income that predicted that person's general life satisfaction, whereas the absolute income and reference income had little to no effect. Our modern culture has equated money and the things it buys as a primary scorecard for social status, which, as we'll see in this video series, on a finite planet is a problem. There's a term called conspicuous consumption, which is the expenditure on or consumption of luxuries on a lavish scale in an attempt to enhance one's prestige. 
But what ends up happening is we purchase things that we don't really need or use and don't make us happy because it's culturally approved and gives us status to do so. Back to Tiger Woods. His yacht is incredibly expensive and probably worth more than most of us will ever make in our collective lifetimes. But how do you think he felt when he saw Ellen's new boyfriend's yacht next to his? It's this dynamic of the disconnect between absolute wealth and relative status and competition that underpins many of modern culture's problems. This dynamic is even evidenced in the environmental movement. Deciding to carpool using your existing car would provide many more societal and environmental benefits than buying a hybrid vehicle. But behaviors like carpooling, at least for now, come across to others as lower status. Each of us swims in status like a fish swims in water and don't realize it. Imagine yourself voluntarily doing something which would reduce your public status among your friends and peers. It's very difficult to do. There is some good news here, though. The graph on the left shows consumption on the bottom scale and fulfillment on the left scale. After our basic needs of survival and comfort are met, we get up to a certain threshold where as we consume more, we become less fulfilled. The graph on the right is a 50-year cross-section of the United States that showed the average income uh, per American was increasing pretty much every year, but the percent of very happy people in our culture stayed the same. The increase in income did not lead to any increase in happiness. I used to manage money for extremely rich people on Wall Street. They didn't really care about how much they had in the bank, but they cared about the change in how much that was on any given day. So they tried to compete to try to go to 300 million or 400 million or 500 million. And it was the relative pursuit rather than the absolute that mattered. One more shopping center, one more development project, one more IPO. It was because of that that I left Wall Street at an early age and started to study this stuff because it's how it all fits together. Energy, brain, behavior, as evolved animals, we don't need all this stuff to be happy. This dynamic becomes even more troubling when we see a graph like this from my friend Juliet Shore. She charted people how much they made in a given year, and a survey is how much they would feel they had to make the next year to make them more happy. And it didn't matter how much money they made, they felt like they needed to make more the next year to be happy. So metabolically, as a culture, are our conspicuous displays of consumption the environmental equivalent of 12-foot antlers in a new forest? We're going to look at questions like this in Nexus 9 videos on energy and economic growth. A final important point. For most of our history, we were egalitarian on consumption of resources, unlike today. But we're never egalitarian on social status. Status and social rank has always been important for humans and other biological organisms. But differential consumption levels of stuff has only been the case for the last 10,000 out of 300,000 years we've been a species. How we measure status might change again in your lifetimes, perhaps soon. Okay, quick summary of the sexual selection and status video. We evolve to posture sexually to attract mates. In modern cultures, this is directly linked to the burning of non-renewable resources. Think about the next time you're shopping or in a city. I doubt any college students are buying giant yachts as displays of fitness, but I don't doubt that most of you feel these same evolutionary impulses to jockey for relative status on your exams, on your clothes, on your resumes. See if you can at least periodically let it go. For a start, be aware of our biological propensity to compare ourselves to others for status, respect, admiration, and acceptance, despite being extremely well off on an absolute basis. Because all this is in our mind, it's hard to bypass this feeling, but we can. How modern culture gives us these strong feelings, which compel us towards certain behaviors, is going to be the subject of the next video.